I remember you had mentioned even when I was at your property that it's it's not possible for you to make enough compost um, based on the amount that you use. So if you could use less, yeah, uh, yeah, but can maybe I, it would be. Can I add a qualification to that? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Way, which is because uh, I sometimes hear this phrase closed loop and that, oh, yeah, you should never buy a compost. You should be able to make all your own. I do not agree with that as a statement mm-hmm. because here, for example, I'm selling in a year maybe three tons weight of vegetables. And my customers do not return their poo. You know, they yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you know, I'm losing organic matter. If uh, if only, you know, that wouldn't it be nice? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But so that's things like importing wood chip. I just don't see the problem with you know using other people's waste materials. That's what I'm doing basically. Uh, yeah. Some people call it ghost acres, but it's not that. It's it's you know it's just a continual ebb and flow of organic matter going around from from one place to another, and it's yeah. very intensive vegetable growing. You, you, you know, you do need quite a bit, and traditionally that's yeah. all. Welcome back, my friends, to the Epic Gardening Podcast. This week, we have a very special guest. We have none other than Charles Dowding. Probably not a name you would give yourself, Charles, but for me, I would say the godfather of No Dig, or the person who's made the No Dig Gardening Method popular with if really millions of people around the world. I think your garden has been a huge inspiration to me. I was fortunate enough to come out and visit it a couple years back and and do a video with you. And we've done a couple things since then, but it's great to have you on officially on The Beat, our new name for the Epic Gardening Podcast. Oh, thank you, Cohen. It's a pleasure to be here and to see you again as well and to chat. Yeah, yeah. It's been it's been a long time. I'd love to get back over there and see. I, I understand you you just bought another acre and have been expanding the space. I did, yeah. It was it wasn't planned either. So the, the neighbor said there might be a possibility, and I actually didn't want to buy it at first. I thought, oh no, you know, just, I don't need more more jobs. Right. Um, and so it was slightly relaxing. I'm really glad I did now, and it's been a fantastic um, chance to experiment and try new things. Yeah. So is that the reason primarily that you purchased the extra space is to have more growing areas to like test out different theories? Yeah. I, when I moved to Homemakers uh, ten years ago, eleven nearly, I. That was my original intention, and it, it's always underlain a lot of what I do is to, to do that exactly. It's a teaching garden, and I, I, I've got the space and a bit of spare time to do that, and and I can try out new things and share that with everybody else. And is, is that whole new acre, that's a, a no-dig space still, right? Well, a lot of it's still wild, actually. Probably about half of it I haven't yet mm. got, got anywhere with, and I've never had a plan, but it's just given me room to try new things, and I'm cropping on it around uh, oh, a tenth of an acre, maybe. And I've okay. got a nice big new shed and I've tried making a couple of ponds and uh, yeah, lots of little projects. Nice. Well, that kind of brings us to today's topic, which is kind of just a primer into No Dig, which is something I'm sure you've talked about ad nauseum. But for those who don't know what No Dig is, maybe this new acre is a good way to introduce people to it. Because I'm assuming you have to go through the very first things you started maybe 11, 12 years ago at Home Acres once again, right? Exactly. And th- and that's one reason why I'm keen to show it, because actually it had a big problem, weed of convolvulus, fine weed, some difficult weeds there, uh, yeah. for, for growing vegetables easily and, and in a time efficient way. So it's been an opportunity to show that. And no dig basically means you don't disturb the soil or disturb it as little as possible. And um, mulch on top, so mulch means covering with um, any kind of initially light excluding material which stops the weeds growing and, and means they can't grow anymore and then feeding the soil life with organic matter on the surface yeah. and that's it <laughs> when you did this new space uh and and started converting it to no dig beds what was the process that you used to to clear the area like could you could you walk us through the step by step well three main aspects to it one is if you've got any woody plants such as brambles there were quite a few the best, most effective way to deal with them is actually to use a spade. And it's like, no dig is not a kind of religious statement, you know, thou shalt never dig. It's, right. uh, you know, dig as little as possible, basically, uh, where appropriate. So sometimes with woody plants, I'll take a spade and remove the bit of stem that's above the ground, and that takes out the main root, and it doesn't regrow. You haven't got to dig the whole area. So mm. brambles, we do that. And, and then you've got a, a hopefully level ground. If you had a lot of bumps and humps in your ground, it might be worth uh, leveling off, actually. And again, that could mean a bit of cultivation uh, to get the surface uh, not dead smooth, but more or less level. It's a lot easier if you do that. Uh, I didn't need to because it was just a weedy pasture. 
that was more or less flat, not entirely. And the, so the next step is then how to uh, stop the weeds growing. And I use one of two methods, either cardboard on top of them with compost on top of the cardboard. And some of the weeds do go through that, particularly the vigorous perennial weeds like uh, the convolvulus. Also, if you have Bermuda grass, dare I say it, I get a lot of questions about that from the States. Uh, right, we, we have a, a lesser equivalent here called cooch grass or Elymus repens. And then um, they, you've got to keep removing them if the, when they re, re go through. So it's not a no work process. You know, that first year can be quite challenging if you've got persistent and vigorous weeds. Yeah. And, and I think a few people get discouraged by that. I totally get it. You know, I've been through that as well. Uh, but if you can hang in there, the, those weed roots only have limited um, energy and they do eventually die. And you, but you don't have much forewarning of that. and They, they just stop growing suddenly. And that's a glorious moment. Um, so that's cardboard and compost. But uh, in a way, an easier way, except you can't grow so much while you're doing it, is plastic. So I'm not against, you know, using plastic in limited applications. And in fact, I use black plastic that I get from my son who's a, in the farming world. It's Farmers use it for covering um, silage that they feed to the cows and, and after that they, they didn't know what to do with it so they'll recycle it I suppose and he gave me a piece. I just put it on the ground but put some compost on first, maybe three inches and you know there's always a question about how much compost to use. Initially it's worth putting on a, a decent dose. You could put up to six inches uh, but I've, I've been trying using less just to see. Three inches works, but you, you don't get quite such a bountiful crop. You get a bit less moisture mm-hmm. retention. Uh, but anyway, then you, you put that on top, and that just smothers all weeds. They don't grow, so it's really easy. But then what you do, you know, we do that like in January. We did it in January this year on a piece of very weedy ground. And in May, we were transplanting squash for um, harvest, harvest in September. And they've grown like anything. It's fantastic. Uh, they wow. start in the compost and they go down to the soil below, which is now free of weed roots because they've died. And we're getting bad for crop while the weeds are still dying. We pull out a bit of bindweed through the plastic holes in the plastic, but it's actually very low input work. But, you know, you couldn't grow carrots or lettuce. So wide space mm. works better. So what you'll do, just so I'm understanding correctly, Charles, what you'll do is you'll cover with the compost three to six inches, cover with the black plastic. Yeah. You don't remove the plastic to plant in. You just cut holes. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks for um, clarifying that because that, that's the initial phase. So that's yeah. from for, for a few months up to, say, eight months in the first year. In our case, because, say, by September, early October, the harvest is taken of the squash, then we'll clear the plant remains to the compost heap and roll up the plastic. It's not there forever. It's a temporary weed suppressing barrier which we can reuse somewhere else if we want to the following year. It's not a single-use plastic either. And mm-hmm. yeah, that, that actually is a really easy way to begin if you've got tricky perennial weeds. Yeah, that's the thing. It's funny you mentioned the Bermuda grass because that's far and away my most nasty weed. Uh-huh. Um, and I'm, I'm in a pretty suburban area still on about a third of an acre, but still it's, you know, there's houses all around. And yeah. We have this front fence facing the communal sidewalk, and that's just, you know, the fence is maybe a foot set back from the actual end of where the sidewalk begins. So there's that little growing area. Uh, and Bermuda just continues to come out over and over and over again. And yeah, it is, it it is discouraging. It creeps under yeah. the fence. Ah. Yeah. It creeps Would under you the fence. Like to, um, put a bit of plastic on that like communal space. I'm sure. So it technically it's still my property, right? Because it's right yeah. before the sidewalk begins, not afterwards. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, my neighborhood, I'm fortunately, I don't live in an HOA area. So I think people would be, would be maybe at least tolerant of it. Maybe if I explained why I was doing it. Yeah. Well, um, but that's what I would yeah, it's, spreading in is, is one of the worst things about these weeds, isn't it? That's the thing. Yeah. And what's happened is because on the margins of, of the property, I've been less particular. It has now creeped into the front yard garden that isn't in, the raised bed area is pretty clean, but the area that's untouched with four or five, six inches of just wood chips, yep. they will, it will creep through those wood chips like crazy. And it actually makes it almost impossible to get rid of because it's, it's so non-uniform to try to rip it out of that area. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it is very frustrating. So Let's go back to the black plastic. Let's say, you know, I, I go ahead and try this in my front yard. Yeah. How, how long would you recommend leaving it there before you then say, I think I'm fine in this area? Well, do you mean specifically for Bermuda grass? Because it does depend on what the weed Sure. Are. Yeah, let's go Bermuda up, cooch Bermuda, and then um, your bindweed. I mean, yeah, the cooch grass that we have here, which I think is a bit less vigorous than your Bermuda, I, I find that by August from an, an initial marching in, say, February, 
Uh, so that's most of our growth season. It suddenly stops growing. Uh, as long as is margins, as you mentioned. So I'm marching pathways as well as beds always is and, and i notice sometimes people don't always do that you've got to mark mm. pathways and actually yeah. that's why i'm not a great fan of, of wooden sides to beds because they, they make that more difficult i like to mark mm. the whole area so i'll put cardboard everywhere in a sheet path and bed and then with the pathways i'll i'll top the cardboard up put another sheet of cardboard on every two months if i see as soon as i see weeds grow through and so if it was bermuda i would just keep removing it from the beds where you can't put cardboard because you want to grow things does that make sense? Right. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I see why then you wouldn't recommend the wooden sides because then it's it's harder to to get that cardboard evenly applied. And, yeah, and again, it, it makes a border. Yeah, an edge where, yeah. where it can thrive underneath the bits of wood. And yeah. say with cooch grass, in our case, eight months, I think your Bermuda is the best part of a, a whole year. Like, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I, I, I have noticed, like, fortunately, there are some areas where we have beaten it back pretty well, like the raised bed garden area, because we're walking right. there so much, we'll always rip it out. Yeah. And eventually, I guess the roots finally do give up. Well, they're not uh, invincible. But... I mean, I, I have had this feedback on YouTube. You know, I really appreciate the comments on YouTube. And I hope we'll get some nice ones here because yeah. they they inform, you know, and inform everybody. And people are happy saying, who me to grass? Yeah, I've, I've got rid of it with no dig, you know, in about a year. That's what they say. Obviously, yeah. they've been yeah. really thorough. Yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, it is it is so discouraging. I think it kind of brings me to this question of a beginner gardener, right? I, I know when I was a beginner, um, I was living in a townhouse. I didn't have a lot of growing space. Maybe there's someone in an apartment or balcony garden or even in a suburban backyard. And then they might come across, let's say, No Dig and, and your channel. Do you think that it is how a beginner should start? Or do you think that it's, um, how do I say it? you have to understand so much about how plants grow and why you would do it that way. That's almost too cumbersome, I suppose. Oh, no, I, I wouldn't agree with that. Um, yeah, no, I would say no, no dig is very much the easiest way to begin. And I do yeah. get a lot of feedback along these lines, but you do need to understand uh, this thing about the perennial weeds, I guess, you know, that, that I think yeah. that is the main stumbling block, but you're going to have that whether you dig or not. And, uh, you know, we have another really difficult one here. I don't know if you have it. It's called mare's tail or horse tail equisita. Mm. And it's sort of prehistoric. I, Charles, believe it or not, I, I actually voluntarily planted that in my um, oh. landscape. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah, so I, I, I have an outdoor shower um, that I put in because my house is really small. And so uh, the outdoor shower feeds my orchard with gray water. And so I figured some of that water does spill off and, and so soak the surrounding soil. What plants like? constantly soaked soil. Uh, Equisetum seems to be okay there. And then I told my friend, Sarah Bendrick, who's a landscape designer, and she was like, you just made a big mistake because you're not <laughs> going to be able to get it out. Well, I was like, well, no, it's contained. It's it's in, there's a pathway blocking it from going. She's like, it'll go six feet underground, throw out a runner and then come back up on the other side. And I was like, okay, well, and she was right. Cause six months, eight months later, I'm pulling the horizontal runners out all over the place it looks amazing though i have to say yeah in its so i wish i could keep it but we'll have to see yeah so that that one can discourage people well the feedback i get with no dig though is for beginners from beginners that it's easier to remove it's not a weed that's ever going to go away and people who spend hours digging but it still grows so it's much yeah. simpler just to leave it alone just don't go there with these weeds smother on top but you need to keep removing them if they're persistent perennials where did no dig begin and also in time, but also in your story, Charles. So I, I don't know if you 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 know, can you share with us, like, how did No Dig come to be? I, I would love to know more of the history of No Dig before about the 1940s is when I, it's sort of documented. But I'm sure people were doing it before that, just they weren't didn't have a name for it. And, and they grew things without disturbing the soil and, and it all worked for them. But most people, certainly in, in my country, in the UK, that traditionally have been cultivating soil with a four chorus bait uh, to get ground ready for sowing and planting. And then in the 1940s, there was a, a, a head gardener, a well-known gardener in um, northwest England. He, he did lots of experiments with, with no dig, and he wrote it up in a book. He was called F.C. King. Uh, mm -hmm. But that, you know, I never really... Never took off. And then I came across, when I started out, um, Ruth Stout's book, No Work Gardening. And, I, you know, she explained it really nicely, I thought. And I, 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 so actually, the first thing I did was I bought a load of old hay. And my father was a farmer. He was horrified. He buy old hay, what you do? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I spread that on the ground, you know, as a mulch. I, I, I could see the, the, the viability of mulching to suppress weeds. Because what I noticed with most gardeners that I saw, 
there's just too many weeds, and and it was it, you know people were spending so much time weeding, and it, and that, and then the weeds just going back. You know, it was never going forwards. It was always just maintaining a status quo if you were lucky. So I thought, right, I'm I'm going to mulch and smother them, and and the hay worked. But in my climate, unlike Ruth Stouts, I got a lot of slugs because we're quite damp here, and she apparently is more dry in Connecticut very cold winters so then i switched from hay to compost and that's pretty much been it ever since and that was in 1983 uh so 40 years now i've been doing this and using different amounts of compost on different soils trying different things variations of the same theme if you like and just carrying on quietly doing it in the background not saying a lot about it because there wasn't much interest in soil and, and, and this kind of thing until quite recently uh, mm. more organic you know i've been organic as well since the early 80s um, and that that was more interesting to people in the 80s because everyone was using pesticide and fertilizer can we really grow food without the chemicals and i started pr- promoting no dig in 2006 when i wrote my first book and it's just been going ever since yeah I, I will say that i think the first time i encountered at least the concept was also a ruth stout book i had seen oh man where where was it i can't remember if it was on early YouTube in like 2010 or 2011. But then I did find a copy of Ruth, the Ruth Stout No Work Garden, tattered copy. I think I bought it off of eBay or something like that and, and read it and was like, first of all, the way she wrote was very engaging. Isn't it? Uh, it she, she just had this sort of no nonsense yeah. approach. I don't know. I really liked it. And yeah. then I had found an old YouTube video that someone had profiled her and interviewed her somehow. And they had it on video. I think they had some sort of video. Uh, and she was just, you just saw the way she was gardening and, and she was saying like, yeah, I don't go to the grocery store. I, I don't like doing any work like that. And you're just like, I kind of want to be like this woman. She seems pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's how I sort of got into it. But I will confess, I didn't really practice it for quite some time after that because I was still growing in very small spaces. Um, you know, this year, last year, maybe ever since we met is when I've started really going more that direction. And uh, it, it's been it's been amazing. I mean, even Jacques, who's on our team, the Garden Hermit, he he did a full Ruth Stout, like classic Ruth Stout potato bed, full hay, planted them in the hay on top of the soil, right? Yeah. And he had his best potato crop he's ever had. Ah, oh, fantastic! Uh, and, and I, I think the hay the hay is more suited to your climate because you're drier, aren't you? So yeah, keeping in yeah. the moisture, and you don't maybe get slugs so badly as we do here. We almost get no slugs whatsoever. We have other pests, obviously, but yeah. the the funny part about so I did a no dig potato similar to your approach. So I did in soil um, and and just didn't touch it. And I got a pretty good harvest, to be honest with you. I will say that some of them did peak above the soil and yeah, they got agree. green, but it's yeah. okay. You know, not a big deal. Whereas Jacques in his hay, <laughs> he had them fully covered the whole time. So you could actually like move the hay away and you'd see the entire structure of the plant. And so he would just basically pull up a subterranean potato that was never buried. And he had these perfect, perfect potatoes. So I got a little yeah. bit jealous. Uh, but yeah, it's it was a really cool experiment to see. Yeah. Um, so so for you, does this does no dig tie in? I know you're you're a vegetarian, right? Well, not all the time, actually. I very yeah. <laughs> uh, like okay. I lived in France for a while. I found there, and uh, it's impossible to be vegetarian in there. Well, very difficult. Yeah, yeah. And, and we had a yeah. small farm, and actually, we were raising animals, and, and I would kill them and eat the meat. Yeah. So I, I'm not totally against eating meat, but most of the time, I eat vegetables. That's my favorite food. I love eating vegetables. So I, you yeah. know, that's what's led me into organic, no dig gardening because I want to eat really healthy, bountiful amounts of food that tastes yeah. really good and fresh, and is really good for me. That I remember because when when I visited your your place, Homemakers, I remember missing the train from London, being really sad, and I was also sick. I think I had a fever or something. Yeah. And I so then I got on the next train, got down there, and then before we went out and did our video together, we had a or maybe it was after, but we had like a meal. It was like soup. You had roasted a rutabaga or something like that, and I remember going like, oh wow, like I like vegetables <laughs> way more in this fashion, right? Yeah, because uh, I've never been the best chef. I, I like to cook. Maybe a different life, I would cook more. But yeah, um, yeah I mean that's well, that's been. W- it's been a privilege for me recently to work with um, a, a, an ex-chef who wants to become a gardener. In fact, she has now. Mm. 
Kate Forrester, and she started her own No Dig Market Garden actually a couple of years ago. Oh, wow. for Ica, for Ica Farm. And we profiled her on our YouTube video. We're going to go back there in August. But that for me is a beautiful synergy that's happening more and oh, more yeah. now. Chefs are really getting into this and, and knowing, learning about what's it truly in season and even yeah. how to grow it. And, and I'm working a lot with chefs now, and I really enjoy that because that's, yeah, you've got to yeah. build these links. And, and children, too, is another one, you know, really get, they, they love No Dig as well. Children, children are are obsessed with it. I found, especially because if a kid is connected to what they're growing, of course they're going to want to eat it. Then instead of just being thrown on the plate, and then yeah, the chef. So there's a book that I had purchased a while ago. It got recommended to me called Six Seasons. Uh, I don't know if you. you no, heard I like it, the of that. <laughs> it's a great it's a great book. So it's it's written by a chef, but he grew up as a gardener, and so. He, he calls it six seasons because I believe he, he counts uh, spring twice and maybe fall twice, I think, different areas of, of that season. And so, yeah, the book is organized by season. And then you go ahead and pick the plant, let's say beets. He'll explain exactly when the beet is ripe, why it's ripe, or not ripe in that case, but you get what I mean, ready. Yeah. Um, and, and then how to effectively work it into a dish. And that's, that's the coolest part to me because he has both. Yeah. Uh, so he, cause I, I remember a lot of chefs, like I, I used to sell to chefs and they would say, oh, the color's amazing. Oh, the flavor's cool. But it's, they, they sometimes didn't really care. Like, is it ready? Is it not ready? Why is it good now? Yeah. That, that gardener side of it, they didn't care about that much. And it seems like that's changing. Yeah, very much. And also until recently, I've been, had hard work selling to chefs cause they have the idea of what they want to prepare and cook mm -hmm. and, and then not so easily influenced by actually what's available <laughs> so they you know they'd rather yeah. go and get it from another country if need be uh, as opposed to using and, and needing to be creative more which is great in the end which would be you you might say would be the mark of an excellent chef right would be to you know use yeah. what's in season at this exact moment and and totally. and go with it i want to go back to the new space uh, that you have and you mentioned it's a great place to experiment. I was curious, like, what kind of experiments are you testing right now in that area? Well, how how to how to smother weeds most effectively, how to save mm. time on anything, how to get the best results. You know, for me, that's one of the biggest appeals of No Dig is the, the, how much time it saves you, uh, and and trying out the effects of using different compost, and actually trying the effect of using less compost, because mm. I know that some people say, well, you know, I, I recommend you starting with a good dose, and I can't get hold of that much, so. What about using a bit less and seeing how it works? And I would say it's not so easy. It involves you and more work. There's more weeding to do in particular. Uh, but I had a lovely comment from a guy in Texas, actually, who said he just didn't want to buy compost, so he waited until he made his own. Then he spread only half an inch everywhere. And he said the results were still way better than when he was tilling, so he's really going for it now and making more compost. Mm. So those kinds of things, just to uh, connect more with people in different situations. Yeah, that's good to know because I, I think I remember you had mentioned even when I was at your property that it's it's not possible for you to make enough compost um, based on the amount that you use. So if you could use less, yeah, uh, yeah, but can maybe I, it would be. Can I add a qualification to that? Sure, yeah, yeah. Saying, which is because uh, I sometimes hear this phrase closed loop and that, oh, yeah, you should never buy a compost. You should be able to make all your own. I do not agree with that as a statement mm -hmm. because – here, for example, I'm selling in a year maybe three tons weight of vegetables, and my customers do not return their poo. You know, they yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you know, I'm losing organic matter. If uh, if only, you know, that wouldn't it be nice? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But so that's things like importing wood chip. I just don't see the problem with you know using other people's waste materials. That's what I'm doing basically. Uh, yeah. Some people call it ghost acres, but it's not that. It's it's you know it's just a continual ebb and flow of organic matter going around from from one place to another and it's yeah. intensive vegetable growing you, you you know you do need quite a bit and traditionally that's yeah. all the case I, I actually totally agree with you i mean if like you said you said it in a very elegantly and elegant way in a sense uh, that they don't return their own poo because if you think about it you are you are removing organic matter every single time you harvest you said three thousand did you say three thousand yeah. pounds uh of produce a year yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's that's 3,000 pounds worth of organic matter and water, of course, that is being removed from the property. So you do have to supplement. And if, let's say, yeah. an arborist, in my case, it, a lot of the times it's an arborist. Right. If they're just going to bring it to the landfill, then certainly it's better off at my house. So so I don't I, I couldn't understand the property of closed loop or the, the principle of closed loop 
the only way it would ever work if you just look at it from a physics perspective is if somehow what's the only source outside of our earth the sun and so if somehow you're generating enough solar biomass yeah. to do it but that's not it's just not possible with the way that you grow yeah well i think it originates from farming more than gardening and, and this causes quite a few misunderstandings because a lot of what gardeners have practiced over the years like four-year rotation i don't know if you have that but in the uk yeah. it's a big one yeah yeah, that comes from farming. That comes from 1780s farming, turnip times only, olive times only. He was improving the medieval three-year rotation by bringing in some sheep and clover and turnips. And why, why is the relevance of that to gardening? You know, that, but it's yeah. been adopted without really thinking about it. And closed loop as well. For a big farm, it can make sense. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think so much of the wisdom, what I noticed at least even starting Epic, was so much of the wisdom of gardening has was not was lost in translation from other methodologies. Yeah. Yeah. And when you when you think about the backyard garden, it's like, okay, well the rules are different here. I'm trying to do something different. So the principles probably change. Yeah, absolutely yeah. right. When I first moved into my home that is now the Epic Homestead, it was basically barren. There were there was almost nothing in the in the yard at all. Maybe one tropical tree, which was great. It's still here today, but but really it was just a very light layer of wood chips and Nothing. So I had a lot of work to do. Charles, what would you think if you saw saw that property as, as it was? I would want to bring that soil to life by yeah. mulching the surface, spreading organic matter on the surface. And yeah. um, then I would grow some plants as much as I could according to the state of the soil underneath and how much organic matter I, I could get hold of and what state it was in. You know, if it, if it was compost, that makes it a lot quicker. It's not necessarily better sure. in the long run. Yeah. But yeah, bare soil for me doesn't mean there's nothing growing in it. It means that, I mean, like my, my beds in the winter here, for example, when nothing is really growing, we have quite a dormant winter. The um, Some of the beds are empty of of plants growing but that's normal you know it's like that they don't grow in the winter uh, and but it means they're ready as soon as the um it warms up in in march we we could go out planting and there won't be any um soil pests like slugs that would have been hiding in say organic matter that uh, plants that might have been growing up or trying to grow over winter uh, so basically with no dig you don't have bare soil you've always got some mulch or cover on top i'm putting roughly an inch a year of compost in the late autumn on all beds and roughly an inch or so of wood chip in all on all pathways and that's it but all the ground is therefore covered all the time yeah yeah so it so just to be clear like covering or yeah. bare bare soil would be truly bare dirt exposed yeah. to the elements if you're covering even with just a thin layer of compost that that counts yeah for me, that, uh, that totally makes sense because you've got to look at yeah. the context of what you're trying to do. Uh, with vegetables, at least in our climate, if if you have uh, too much residue of organic matter uh, or, or even cover crops that are decaying, you know, in, in spring when you're trying to plant, that can harbor a lot of slugs and other pests and make your, your cause your new plantings to fail. Uh, that's one of, and if your new plantings fail, you've then not got anything growing in the ground. So I want maximum success once the growing season is underway here. That's about the middle of March onwards. And uh, at that point, by the end of March, or I'll say by the March equinox, actually, we've probably got 80% of beds are actually growing something already. They've got mm. seeds, if not plants. And then by 20th of April, it's a, a month later, it's about 85%. And by 20th of May, say another month later, it's 95%. And there's always 5% of beds that are actually not growing something at any one time because they're waiting for a new plant. And that right. is a full garden. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So let's see. At the end of a season then, you mentioned the cover crops decaying. H how much will you clear or not clear those as you move from fall through winter then? Well, that's fascinating because what we do is, uh, I say the growing season here, it roughly ends about mid to late November. Uh, if you look to my garden in mid-November, like 80% of the beds still have vegetables growing. You know, because we're, right. we're, we're keeping cropping right the way through the season. And then that starts to fall away quite fast. And some of the some of the beds that are growing things, the other 20% is growing cover crops. And one cover crop I really like in this climate works well is a mustard, a white mustard, Sinapis alba, uh, because you can sow it like late September, even early October. It grows really fast, two, two feet high and, um, by early December. And then it's killed by frost. 
And that's the beauty of it. No, so no d- tilling in or, or whatever. You don't have to work to remove it. It just dies down. It makes a thin straw on top of the soil. That's it. So all winter, and you can sow and plant through it. It's, you know, it's just a, a dream. So Easy to go. Another, if it's vegetables, though, we will remove them physically. So twist them out with as little soil disturbance as possible. Say the stalks of cabbage, stems of cabbage and lettuce. Sure. Uh, so we I just remember... get all better growing plants if it's sorry, sorry if it's vegetables. When I, when I visited, I believe it was mid December. It was. Um, it was yes. December 12th or 13th of 2018. And you did still have, I would say it was mostly empty, but there was, there was rutabaga in the ground still. There were some of, some of those brassicas were still in the ground. And I, you had even mentioned, I think you'd twist, twist, twisted one out to harvest it. So yeah. It seems like you were just at the tail end. And like you said, I mean, going into December still, you had some stuff in the ground. Yeah. And we, we can have kale and leeks and quite a few salad plants and broccoli getting ready for spring. So we, we still have quite a few vegetables in the ground but it's you know three quarters of the beds are empty of plants yeah. in the winter so so here's a question uh maybe a bit of a beginner question what what's your perspective on like land laying fallow to then become productive later what do you think about that well what do you mean by fallow that's the question, right? Is yeah, is, is it is does it. does fallow mean bare dirt? In that case, I would imagine you would not be in favor. But if fallow means no. over the winter you've covered with compost, that's sort of what it's supposed to do, and it should it should come back just fine. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't really call that fallow. I think for me, the right. word fallow is something that applies in in the growing season to uh, soil, which I think actually the, the, the traditional use of the word meant growing wheat, because in, mm. in in the really old rotations they had in farming. Um, like hundreds of years ago, it was wheat, barley, fallow. And as a kid, I was wondering, what is this fallow? Nobody really explained what it meant. And if you leave ground empty of crops um, and you don't till it or do anything or plow it, it'll just grow weeds. And, and that's yeah. actually what they meant, which is like a cover crop. So it was weeds as a cover crop. And for me, that's not a good thing to have in a vegetable garden because right. the seeds are going to go everywhere. The runners like Bermuda grass, you know, that spread out. So, yeah, fallow is not something i recommend it right. except natural bareness if you like but with compost mulch I, in the winter. i've noticed yeah because i have there's certain areas of the property that i'm not actively cultivating little corners of pathways and such and right. you know if i haven't covered it with perhaps chips or stone or something like that you're right i mean the, the earth will cover it for right. you with things that you don't want yeah which is what a weed is it's just a plant that you did not want in that space and so i've, I've thought about you know just even just throwing cover or wildflowers or, or something in that area, just so I can control the thing that's going to grow. Cause something's going to grow anyways. Something's going to grow. Yeah. We actually use a lawnmower around the edges of my cropped area and that keeps the grass and weeds um, to, to a very neutral state. They still grow, but they're not invading. And that, that's yeah. one way. If you've got a larger property, you can do that. Uh, but in your climate, probably I don't think you get grass growing, that you need that. Yeah. I think in our climate, there's probably some areas I could pull off the grass. Fortunately, I have rainwater capture and a, and a pond now, so I can redirect. But in my area, really, grass, by and large, should not grow. And so I, I'm trying to, I guess, respect that and, and not allow it to grow, at least at least the common grass, like a lawn, right? There are some grasses yeah. that work. Well, I think the difference between our two situations is a very nice example for your listeners because you know yeah. everybody has different climate, different weather uh, situation, growing season. So... To some extent, you, you've got to work it out according to where you are. Uh, but yeah. when you understand the principle of just having edges, say, where weeds can't invade too much, um, keeping ground covered always with organic matter on the surface, but not necessarily growing plants, particularly once in wintertime. You know, those yeah. two principles really go a long way. Yeah, yeah. I think to, to put a nice bell on the, the end of today's show is there's a total area in my front yard that I just have not decided what I want there. I think it's going to be an extension of the fruit orchard. But so my solution in the meantime, which might be a year or two, is I just covered it with six to eight inches of arborist chips and basically put it in a holding pattern until I figure out what I want to do with it. And then it's just it's going to be better by default by the time I actually decide to grow something there. Yeah, definitely. If you've got a couple of years, that's, that's a good idea. I'd love to hear, I guess, your take on companion planting in general. Like, what do you think about it at a high level? Yeah, I think about it, I think, differently to how it's often talked about. And I'm so interested to answer people's questions about it with evidence from my garden. And I would say that, just for example, multi-sowing. I don't know how many of your listeners are familiar with that, but it's where you grow several seedlings in a clump and you plant them out as a clump. 
you know, they're, I, I like to say, well, they're going in the ground with their mates. You know, they're, they're, they're friends, they're companions. And that's how I see companion planting. It's, it's companionship um, between little seedlings, especially. When little seedlings go in the ground, they do not like being miles from another little seedling. You know, so this mm. single space plant I do, I do as little as possible and try and always have something nearby. Uh, so that's, that's what it is for me. And that I don't find that there are, I don't think, I haven't come across anything that doesn't like anything else. So I don't, I don't see that there are any bad companions. The only time that would happen is if any one plant is very greedy for light and moisture. Yeah. So it's just going to take the space. You know, it's a bit yeah. of a bully. <laughs> and, and whatever's there is just going to suffer. I mean, like zucchini or courgette will, will do that a bit, you know. Yeah. yeah. So Yeah, I would say, yeah, I kind of agree with that. I think it's less about what companions wouldn't work and more about, uh, to me, I think about it very from a very practical standpoint, right? So, you know, if, if, if I know, let's say, tomatoes certainly suffer from, like, let's say, the hornworm, and I can put something somewhere near the tomato, a companion that attracts things that kill the hornworm, then, of course, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but I think the interesting thing you, you just brought up is that you would consider multi-sown, uh, let's say, beets, right? You yeah. would consider those as a companion plant, even to though it's themselves. the same plant. To yeah. themselves, exactly. Yeah. And that's that's a unique twist that I think not a lot of people talk about. And ever since yeah, I saw I'm, you do that, I, I think I saw you do it in a video, not when I was at your house. And I was like, oh, why don't I do that? That makes complete sense. And now yeah. I've just started to do it ever since. Yeah, good. Yeah, so um, close spacing in general, you know, actually works well. You've got to you've got to know the details. The spacing has to be correct, obviously. But you, many, many people, I think, could probably space, space more closely than, than they work at the moment. Uh, like, for example, I just put a post on Instagram recently about our harvest of onions. And people say, well, that's a lot of onions. How do you grow so many in space? You know, so it's multi so And then I put 12 inches between clumps of three or four. So they're pretty tight in there. And there's, you can hardly move between the onions. If you needed to hoe, for example, you couldn't. But that's okay. the beauty of no dig because we haven't got many weeds. So we hardly Right, you don't need to. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. I, I found the most success, and it's following up to a question I'm going to ask you, is I found the most success multi-sowing with plants that are producing a bulb of some kind at the bottom or swelling, like yeah. you know, onions, beets, radishes, that's these it. sorts of things. Do, would you also multi-sow uh, any leafy green? Well, only if I'm going to harvest, if I want to harvest small leaves. So we will do yeah. it for, say, chard if we want to harvest salad leaves as opposed to cooking leaves. But if it was big leaves for cooking, then it, ones or twos maybe. Uh, leeks yeah. I do in, in two, three or four because I find that's an efficient use of space. I don't get monster leeks, but they're still very nice. And they go in the ground again. They, they get away more quickly. And it's sufficient propagation as well because of that thing how, you know, I'm sure you know, so you, you can raise so many transplants in, in a much smaller space, smaller amount of compost. It's big savings all around. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's funny because when we first started doing this, let's say with like a French breakfast radish, right? multi sown French right. breakfast. The smaller those are generally, the more it would be a prized ingredient in a recipe. Oh, yeah. But if you're multi sowing them, the, by nature, they're going to be a bit smaller because they are sort of yeah. sharing that space. And so yeah. it's it, one way of seeing it would be, oh, I'm getting less big radishes. And the other way of seeing it is actually, oh, I'm getting more gourmet uh, More, prize radishes yeah right? we, which is we get, we get loads of medium onions you know as opposed to a few big ones and actually yeah. they're, they're more useful in the kitchen Tennis yeah it's it, it's you know it's funny you bring that up because this year was my most successful bulbing onion year ever um i got you know dozens and dozens of pounds of them and they're monsters because oh. i i what i did is i did the opposite of what you recommend is i i multi-sowed the seed and then i split the seeds out and planted them at at a sort of the correct spacing or whatever, uh, just to see what would happen. And they blew up. They're huge. And you're totally right. I mean, one big onion, I can't, my recipe might call for half of it. And then what do I do with the other half? You know? So it, it, it's worked out in, in a couple of different ways for me. Are there any companions that you have found in the more traditional yeah. definition that, that you really do enjoy? Yeah, I've tried a lot. And actually, one of the first things I did back in the 80s was you know, everyone said, oh, you keep carrot root fly the pest off by planting onions nearby because the root fly don't like the smell of onions. And I had a bed with loads of onions and just a few carrots in as it happened. And um, 
when I came to pull them, I thought, well, these should be good. And they, they were just stuffed full of the, the carrot root uh, pest. So, you know, that's what made me realize it's not as straightforward as that. And, and companion planting is sometimes presented as the equivalent to, say, using a pesticide or, you know, it solves all those yeah. problems. Not like that. Depends on the year and so many other factors. Uh, but some things I do that, like, you know, help, I would say. It's never a um, total solution. But uh, dwarf French marigolds are really like with a lot of vegetables, actually. And they do secrete something called limonene, apparently. I think that's a fairly recent discovery. And that deters aphids. It's a smell that aphids don't like. So that's mm. how I find, you know, keep, keep your white fly population lower. It won't get rid of them all on your tomatoes. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think of it kind of similarly. Charles is like, let's say the example I, I mentioned, if where you were to say plant alyssum with uh, tomatoes, alyssum with very, very small flowers, the hoverflies and some other parasitic wasps, in theory, should come in uh, and then lay eggs in the hornworm. There's this whole chain of ecology that would yeah. suggest, it, you know, would happen. But you're totally right. I mean, it's not a guarantee that number yeah. one, they're going to be there. And number two, there's going to be enough. Yeah. It's, it's almost like, you know, so, some small effect may or may not happen in conjunction yeah. with the, the broader, you know, ecosystem that you're sort of developing. Yeah. But better than nothing, so you might as well do it. For me, it ties in also with the uh, understanding that you don't have to do a four-year rotation. Yeah. And that means you're much more free to plant groups of plants around the garden. So if you look at my garden, for example, I've got a block of onions here, a block of onions there, and another one over there. And they're all spread out. And I think that's a healthy way. You could call that companion plant, if you like, because you, you've got adjacent plants, in, you know, of all different yeah. kinds uh, dotted through the garden, not individually, but in, in a sort of mosaic in, tapestry. In blocks, yeah. yeah. Th this is the first year in our garden here that we've kind of gotten close to that, where it, just by nature of when the beds were clearing themselves yeah. and, and what we had at the time. So yeah. so I said, you know, bulbing onions were a great crop this year for us, and, and there were uh, four separate beds that they were in. Uh, and so some of them are actually still in the ground. Most of them are, are now cured. Uh, and similarly, let's say with our tomatoes, I have most of my vining tomatoes on this back trellis, but I wanted, um, these more bushing determinates. So I, I dedicated a bed in the front yard, uh, to that. And it's a totally separate area. So let's say if a pest was to come, at least only yeah. one of them might be hit, you know? Exactly. And it's much more fun, I find, you know, because you can be creative and, and you, I don't work to a rigid plan at the beginning of the year. And my whole garden is just sort of ebb and flow the whole time. And, you know, some might say, well, you need a bit of experience to do that. Well, yes and no, actually, because you really have got the freedom to put things almost yeah. where you want to put them. And especially with succession planting, as space becomes available, I yeah. don't always have a pre-plant. Where am I going to I'll sow some, I'll sow some beetroot, say, in June and for planting midsummer, and I don't always know where I'm going to put them. I just know that I want to have some beetroot plants on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I do the same. So this, this year... Um, we have a greenhouse now. And so it's become, not that it was ever hard to start seeds, but it's a little bit more uniform uh, conditions for starting seeds in, in my climate now. And when we start, I'll always tell if I'm starting or if someone on our team is starting, I'll just say like, just start, I don't know, 50% more seeds than you think we'll need. Definitely. And we, we will always find a spot because you never know, maybe something dies, maybe yeah. you harvest early. You always want to have something to put in there. And what, yeah. what's happened as a result is the garden has become more alive feeling where the beds aren't as uniform. There's something random popped into a corner somewhere. Maybe a melon goes on the side of one bed that we never thought would be there. And now it's spilling over the bed and looking very beautiful. And so I've noticed that sort of the overall tapestry of the garden has, has really gotten more beautiful. And related to this and related to companion planting is interplanting. Because that also, if you've got uh, more plants than you know what where to put them, you, you know, we're putting, say, kale between onions so the onions right. are coming into the last month they're like i know that they're going to finish i've got a kale plant and i could put it between in the onion bed between them all broccoli and uh, then you know it just gets its roots down it doesn't have to it doesn't need to grow enormous just in those first few weeks and then you remove your your harvest of say onions and suddenly you've got you've got a kale plant well established and we in no time at all it's really big we put yeah. fennel between cucumbers and so on there's many possibilities yeah yeah i think I don't know. I mean, I, I'm I'm certainly don't have enough as much growing experience as you, but I you know maybe ten years now in different varieties and different techniques. And so this deep into it, I've started to see the rules 
do and don't apply at the same time. And I mean like the common wisdom, so to speak, where if you know what you're doing, you can sort of break and and shift all these rules and Definitely. it makes sense in, in your own weird conception of how a garden should look. And somehow it, I don't know, it somehow feels like it's elevating the experience. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very wary of rules because you. I think one should always ask where they came from and, and in what yeah, yeah. they've developed and what, yeah. who they apply to and all that kind of things. And right. if people say to me, you, you shouldn't do this, whatever, well, I say, well, why? You know, give why me not? a reason. Yeah. <laughs> you should always ask a reason if people take the, the, the five, have you heard of the five whys uh, rule? No. <laughs> so, so, so if someone says anything, really, uh, I want to do this in my life or you right. should never plant tomatoes with this, you say why, and they'll give you a reason, and you say, "Okay, well, why?" And uh, they give you something. And, okay, why? So if you get usually when you get down to five, yeah. someone says, "Yeah, I don't really know, honestly." You know, oh, I don't. Because really? <laughs> yeah. eventually, it becomes apparent that unless someone has, let's say, like yourself, if I was to ask you, I well, you would say, "Well, it's because I've been doing it for forty years, and I've seen over forty years that, yeah. that this is the." And then I can't contest that because that's the real experience, right? Uh, but someone else may, you know, say, oh, well, it's, uh, I read it in a book. Well, wh what book was it? Oh, oh, I don't really remember. Oh, who, well, right. where, who, where did that, where did that person get that thing from? Right. Oh, well, I actually don't, I don't even know. And so, yeah, it's, I, I, I myself too, I'm, I'm sort of wary of taking things at face value. It's it, better to it, test. It also comes back to no dig because, you know, with no dig, you're starting from a very different place. And a lot of assumptions are, are, are built into common advice that, that soil has been cultivated. Like the, um, there's a common one we have here is don't put compost or manure on top uh, in your soil when you're going to grow carrots and parsnips because it makes them fall. And mm. that does happen if you dig it in. But that's being, it's assumed that, you know, or was it? Uh, I see. But yeah. it's on the surface, it's just feeding the soil. So we actually, uh, gardening plants so simple. We just simply spread compost on all the beds, uh, sometime in late autumn, early winter, uh, whatever I'm going to grow. And I'm not thinking in terms of heavy feeders, light feeders. That's another rule. It's probably the old categorize sure. you need to know about. Uh, you're feeding soil, and then you can grow anything you fancy anywhere you like in your garden, pretty much. There's two little anecdotes I want to share with you here. One is someone we just had on the show. Um, he had mentioned that not only is the soil important for gut health, but the air around the soil in almost a vertical column from the surface upwards, the level of microbes that are beneficial that eventually make it into your body, you're breathing, of course. Uh, uh, and he mentioned that even it's theorized even that that's why children have stronger immune systems or part of why they have stronger immune systems is literally because they are closer to more of the beneficials in the air. And then someone else we had on the show called soil the earth's stomach or the earth's gut and i thought that was very clever because you know if you think about it it's it's there's the whole soil food web and all the little microorganisms that are interacting and in, in much like our own system yeah that's a brilliant analogy actually i really like that and you've got yeah. these things like uh, bacillus and vacca which are bacteria floating in the air above soil and uh, we like you say we breathe them in and apparently they're one part thing that's really necessary to make serotonin in, in our brains yeah. and that's the feel-good mood factor so yeah everything makes sense then more to me i you know finding yeah. out these things things i've done by instinct really um suddenly and, and you know that lovely knowledge that if you Look after your gut. The gut is a quarter of the brain. It's 80% of the immune system, roughly. I mean, not exactly. Uh, but that's empowering because it means that by, by eating fresh produce from healthy soil, uh, you know, I'd like to say no dig. I feel, you know, because you're really favoring the microbes. You're going to have healthier plants and, and be healthier yourself. There was that book called What You Eat Eats, I think. Ah, uh, uh, yeah. It, no, What it, Your it, Food Eat. Isn't it something like uh, James? So, uh, Montgomery. Something like that. Yeah. I, I yeah. we'll we'll see if we can add it to the podcast description here. But yeah, it was a similar concept, but more along the lines of when you consume an animal, the what that animal ate is of course yeah. more important almost than the animal itself. And it, 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 if you think of the vegetables as the animals of the soil, <laughs> I guess right. yeah. you know it's it's what they're consuming and and even to a different level, like what the larger microorganisms in the soil are then consuming, right? So it's almost down yeah. to the atomic unit of the smallest particle of life in the soil. Yeah. Uh, is, is, that's where you have to go. Yeah, th this links to a, a, a fascinating understanding of health, which is different to what's commonly out there, I would say, because we, we are, are thinking of health and disease is based on Louis Pasteur's germ theory, which is that the body's an organism that needs protecting from invading um, germs, microorganisms, fungi, bacteria, um, viruses, whatever. 
Um, and, and the other way of looking at it is, was Pasto's rival, Antoine Deschamps. It was the body's a collection of microorganisms. And we're the controlling part of that. We Because we determine what we eat and how we react to all of those microorganisms. And, and it's actually good to have a lot of biology coming in all the time. Some things yeah. that have been labeled bad, you know, like bacteria. Uh, which are now actually really actually significantly good in many ways, and uh, we, health is is a positive state of balancing the balance of those microorganisms, and that's where the gut really comes in as well. Yeah, well, it it reminds me in a funny sense of this. There was a movie that came out, I don't know, maybe in the '90s called Bubble Boy, and it was about a kid who had to live in a bubble his whole life because his immune system was so fragile. But he, obviously, that's an extreme example. But you you might say, you know modern parents, let's say, who have a child and, and they sort of shelter them from the earth and the world. And especially in, in during the times of the pandemic, they don't, they don't see anyone. They don't interact with animals, with soil. You have to wonder what it's done to their immune system in, in yeah. early stages of their life. They need to do a bit of gardening. And, and yeah, I, I think so. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> it's really like yeah. your gardening. So that's, that's what they need. <laughs> so, so when we tie this, Charles, to no, to no dig, Let's say I was to do the opposite, right? I was to dig until every year, maybe every season. What what would I then be doing to the soil, and thus, I guess, to my own gut? Well, you, you you're losing life, basically. You're losing biology because every time the soil is tilled, there's an escape of carbon to the air. You know, that's carbon dioxide, basically. Mm-hmm. And carbon is the building block of all soil life processes. So, yeah, the so your your soil would be winding down, and, and that. And then what does it do? It grows weeds because weeds are a healing process. You know, that, that's one reason why constant tilling, you just get more and more weeds. You ne- never get on top of them. So just re- stop that. You know, if you want to reverse that, if you're in that situation now, uh, all you've got to do is get, get your ground level, rake it level, spread some compost on top or even any organic matter. Feed, start feeding the soil life and your soil will come back to life again. And, and you will notice then, I'm sure, that you're, not only will your food taste better, but it will bring you more health than you you, you have at the moment. I, yeah, I work on that. Yeah, I'm I'm in an interesting phase of life right now. I'm on a health challenge. I'm doing a health challenge with my with my girlfriend and actually a couple members of the Epic Gardening team. And one of the rules I've set for myself seventy five days is 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 the length of time. One of the rules is I have to eat whole foods only. So you know vegetables, meats, eggs, milk, that kind of thing. Uh, cause I, I have a sweet tooth, you know, I like to eat candies and, you know, yeah. pies and stuff like that. And so, uh, this is just a way to get healthier. And what I've noticed is in consuming more of these whole foods and obviously with the garden, I have most of the vegetables I need here. Magically, who would have thought that, um, my, my overall gut feels less bothered day by day. Every, I mean, I'm only eight days in, but I feel dramatically better just in my whole gut area. It's not like you know, what, normally it would be, I would be thinking about it. I'd say, oh, it doesn't feel so good today, this or that. Now, now it feels like my elbow. I don't think about my elbow at all, yeah. right? And, and it feels very similarly. So it's, you know, just one little point for those of you listening. Yeah, to, well, I feel blessed. I'm with never this. actually really worried about it, particularly where I am now and, and the food I eat. It's just fantastic. But is your diet, yeah. is it plant-based or are you eating some meat and fish as well? I, I am eating some meat and fish. I think we're, so I have chickens now so that the eggs are coming out of the backyard. Um, my end goal is to, so I live in San Diego, so I can fish. Um, so my end goal would be to fish or dive for the, the seafood that I eat. Um, and then I'm learning to hunt. So I'll, I'll, hopefully I'll be going on a hunt later this fall and I'll learn to, to hunt. And then, you know, if you have one animal successfully there, then that's quite a bit of meat. So in a perfect world, I'd, I'd like to, to get to that state of being, uh, but you know, I've lived 35 years in a very suburban way. So it's, I have to, you know, there's some re- reprogramming that has to take place. Yeah. Yeah. I really like to grow things like beans. Uh, so for dry beans and that, that's a good source of protein, but actually a lot of vegetables have more protein in them than we realize kale is yeah. 3% protein, for example. So it's totally feasible to be pretty vegetarian, but I, I do eat butter and things like that. You know, I really, yeah. Eat so, uh, but yeah, like you, butter on some, some home baked sourdough. Is oh, to yeah, that, you know, well, yeah. <laughs> um, whole, whole food, you know, that's always been for me kind of common sense really, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's totally common sense. I think I got, you know, I, I didn't grow up in this fashion, right? So there was a lot I had to unprogram myself. And as I've gotten down further in, in the growing journey, I've realized, oh, actually, it really was just very simple all along. Good. 
Uh, you strip the complexity out of it. Oh, just eat whole foods, grow your own food, be in yep. the sun, mess around in the soil. Ma magically, you happen to feel better in life. Like who who knew, you know? Uh, so it's it's funny how that all works. Well, Charles, it's been great to have you on the show. Um, you have a lot of ways that people can reach you and contact you. you have books, courses. W what's the best place for people to reach out? Uh, well, maybe start on my website and have a look at what we're offering in the way of teaching. We've got I've got online courses in node gardening and in one called Skills for Growing, which is all the backup techniques you need for growing vegetables, things like watering, spacing, how to sow and propagate, um, how to grow through the winter. And then I've got another uh, course called Seed to Harvest, where I take each vegetable in turn and just how to grow, starting from the seed right through yeah. to storing and also saving seeds sometimes as well, where appropriate. Um, and then I'm on social media big time, um, YouTube, Instagram, and, and I do my best to reply to comments. I get to most of the of questions. And um, I've written books, so you have a look at them um, I, a recent one two recent ones like no dig um has gone all over the world and children's no dig children's gardening book actually hasn't sold so fast in the uk but it sold out in the us apparently so was, oh nice okay yeah nice congrats on that that's yeah cool. I know that, that one had come out chinese apparently so yeah wow that's cool that's really cool well thank you so much for coming on uh highly recommend you check out charles work everyone listening we did a video together. I'll put that uh, in the video to, uh, podcast description as well. A tour garden has obviously changed a lot since we've done that tour. Maybe I'll have to come out some sometime soon and do it again. But thanks for coming on, Charles. Uh, it's a pleasure. Love you. Talk to you again, Kevin. See you yeah, soon. Yeah, you too.